Our next speaker is the tallest journalist in Alberta, an award-winning writer, and the author of literary nonfiction books such as Darwin's Moving and Rising Stories of the 2013 Alberta Flood. And also, his books are on Nenshi's recommended reading list here in the library, which is pretty cool. So please put your hands together for Taylor Lambert. <laughs> I think the mic's a little low, Steve. <laughs> Can we get like some phone books to set it on? <clears throat> Tip it. Hello, can you hear me? Is this okay? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I wanna talk about a subject that is both very difficult and very important. It's hard to do that in 20 slides, but I'm gonna try. It's something that we are overdue to have a serious conversation about as a society. And I think the best way for me to approach it is to tell you about my own personal journey through that subject and how I came to realize a fundamental ugly truth about my country. I was born in Regina, and both sides of my family have roots in Saskatchewan. That's my father's hometown. But my family doesn't have a terribly long history in Canada. I'm second generation Canadian on my mom's side, third on my dad's. And I grew up feeling Canadian, but also very much connected to my family's immigrant roots. I had an ordinary, comfortable, middle-class childhood, growing up partly in Regina and partly in Calgary. And as you might expect, I encountered children of different backgrounds and races when I was in school. And I was always taught to respect everyone, regardless of who they were or what color their skin was. Everyone was equal. I'll come back to that idea of equality later on, but it's worth noting that I had no interaction with indigenous people or culture whatsoever growing up on the prairies. Regina is in Treaty 4 land, Calgary's in Treaty 7, but I never heard those terms. I had stereotypical ideas of so-called Indians, and I knew they lived on reserves, and I assumed this is what those reserves looked like. Now, even when I was a young kid, I loved reading, and I loved history. I was a nerd. I still am. Uh, it seemed to me to be really important to understand history if you wanted to understand the world. And I still believe that's true, in fact, more than ever, but I know now that you can't rely on a society to give you an accurate history of itself. When Stephen Harper apologized for the residential school system in 2008, I was 23 years old, and I had never heard of residential schools. So I started reading. And if I had to pick a moment when I first began to question and eventually came to reject the entire narrative of Canada that I've been taught my whole life, it was that moment. Uh, yes, I know this is a little silly, but, but, just as in The Matrix, when the true ugly nature of Neo's reality is revealed to him, recognizing the white supremacy that our country was founded on and which is still baked into the bones of our modern society, changed forever my understanding of Canada. We are not a benign nation. We were and are a colonial occupying power, and these are the people we colonized. It is, nothing about this history is obscure or hidden. It is all very well documented. And once you make an effort to go and learn about how Canada was settled, it's easy to understand why the collective forgetting of that history was so important. These are the treaties the Crown signed with sovereign indigenous nations in order to peaceably advance settlement. You'll notice the rather important areas of our country that we simply just took. But if you wanted to believe that we simply made some land deals and that's the end of the story, that's false comfort. Not only has Canada consistently failed to honor the terms of these agreements, there's documented evidence that ruthless tactics were used to force First Nations to agree to these one-sided deals, including but not limited to state-sanctioned deliberate starvation. Even long after the treaties, the government would often expropriate reserve land without consultation or compensation, one example of which is the building of the Bassano Dam in 1910. In 2015, after seven years of research and consultation, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reported that the residential school system, which had sought to assimilate indigenous children by destroying their connection to their language and culture, resulted in, quote, cultural genocide a horrendous but warranted charge that we have not even begun to grapple with as a country. It's nothing short of remarkable, this collective forgetting of our true history, but while our segregation and stereotyping of indigenous people continues today, the ideals behind that history, the ideal of a civilized white culture elevated above all others affects more than just indigenous people. We've always had others. During the First World War and for two years after, Thousands of Ukrainian Canadians were forcibly interned. Some were subjected to forced labor, which helped to build Banff National Park. 
In the Second World War, it was Japanese Canadians' turn. 22,000 of them forcibly evacuated from the West Coast, often having their property confiscated. Here's a fun Alberta fact. We had by far the largest eugenics program in the country, one of the largest in North America, forcibly sterilizing nearly 3,000 people between 1928 and 1972, including some who were not told about the procedure they were undergoing. The primary targets, indigenous people and people of color. If you cling to the belief that we've left this ugliness all behind us, statistical analysis clearly shows institutional racism is alive and well. One of many examples is carding, the police tactic of stopping people on the street to demand their ID, which is then recorded. This practice disproportionately affects people of color by a huge margin. Canada is ranked sixth on the United Nations Human Development Index. First Nations in Canada are ranked 63rd. Government statistics on the number of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls range from 1,100 to over 4,000. 93 reserves have boil water advisories, and if your response to that is to say they should just move to a city, that's colonialism. My personal journey towards understanding these truths began with asking questions and reading books. And by the way, my last two slides will have some book recommendations for you. I also had some important conversations with friends who experienced everyday society in far different terms than I did solely because they were not white. Simply removing overt racism and slurs from our public discourse would not make our society equal. Racism is hidden in our machinery and in the not so hidden details of everyday life. White privilege is not only real, it serves to convince those who benefit from it that our society is already fair when it was never designed to be. In sharing this with you, I hope to motivate people to question what they know and to put in the work to educate themselves. These are just a few books that were meaningful for my own understanding, but there are so many wonderful and brilliant writers writing about not only how racism manifests itself in Canada, but also about communities of color and indigenous culture. History is, of course, important, and we need to understand it to understand ourselves, but equally important is understanding contemporary lives and realities through the art produced today by people in those communities. And if you put in the work to find them, and are open to what they have to say, you'll find remarkable perspectives. And we can all use more perspective. Thank you.